Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. A very, very warm, huggy welcome on this violent afternoon. Winter is certainly here, and I'm very, very grateful that you battled through the snow to be with us here this afternoon. My name is Ulrika Alchamis, and I am Director of Collections and Public Programs here at the Aga Khan Museum. And before I have the greatest pleasure to present a truly exceptional speaker to you today, I would like to acknowledge that the land on which this museum stands today has been a land of cultural encounters for many thousands of years. Under the stewardship of the indigenous peoples of Turtle Island, including the Huron Wendat, the Petun First Nations, the Seneca, and most recently the Mississaugas of the Credit River. We are grateful for their stewardship and we thank them for sharing the land with them. On to our speaker for this afternoon. Dr. Augustus Casely Hayford was born in London and educated at the School of Oriental and African Studies at the University of London, where he received his doctorate in African history and has continued to hold very strong ties as an honorary fellow, a research associate, and a member of its Center of African Studies Council. After his studies, Dr. Casely Hayford embarked on a distinguished career as one of the most prominent British cultural historians, writers, and broadcasters associated with Africa. Known for his outstanding scholarship, his intellectual versality, and his warmth and humility, he curated and advised on major exhibitions with the National Portrait Gallery, Tate Britain, and the British Library in London, as well as organizing the largest African art season in Britain as director of Africa 05. Dr. Casely Hayford is also a frequent on-air commentator and contributor to Champion Africa, including the presentation of two series devoted to the Lost Kingdoms of Africa produced for the BBC, and a recent TED Global Talk on pre-colonial Africa. If that were not enough, Dr. Casely Hayford is also a distinguished author with books to his name on the Lost Kingdoms of Africa, Timbuktu, and the Mali Empire, a fellow of the Cultural Institute at King's College London, a trustee of the National Trust, and a board member of the Kane Prize for African Writing. It is perhaps no surprise then that Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II awarded him with an order of the British Empire for services to arts and culture in June 2018. That year also saw Dr. Casely Hayford take up the directorship of the Smithsonian's National Museum of African Art, the nation's premier museum devoted to the arts of Africa. But it seems that the United Kingdom was not ready to let him go for good and missed him too much because he has just been appointed as the inaugural director of the new VNA East Museum and Research Center in London, a position that he will take up in spring 2020. Before I now invite our speaker to the podium, please may I ask you to silence your cell phones and I have to also tell you that filming in the auditorium is not permitting. And now please give a very, very warm welcome to our special guest speaker today, Dr. Augustus Casely Hayford. Thank you so much. And I do love this city, um, other than the weather, of course, but it's it's I mean, as a counter to the coldness, the warmth of reception that I always receive here is astounding. And at this institution, it has been utterly exceptional. And this is an exhibition that um, we have worked to co-develop with this institution and also the block in Chicago. And I saw its first manifestation in Chicago um, earlier this year. And this institution, the way in which it has been re-rendered is utterly exceptional. In the way in which 
you do everything. It is such a pleasure to be here and to be amongst a group of museum specialists, people who are dedicated to serving the audiences of Toronto in such a wonderful way. It is an example for our whole sector. Thank you so much, uh, Ulrika. Thank you, Salima. Thank you to everyone who works in this inst institution, but also to all of you who support it, because this is a treasure in the museological firmament, a real treasure and a real pleasure and privilege to be here. So thank you so much. And I'm there's such a wide brief that I, I operate over, but this is a topic that I utterly adore. You know, this particular story that this exhibition tells. Um, and I can't think of a time in which it was more critical for us to be thinking about this particular topic. And this continent, Africa, uh, is utterly extraordinary. I mean, this is a landmass of 11 million square miles, and that's larger than China, Europe, the United States combined. And it's home to more than 3,000 distinct ethnic groups who speak more than 2,000 languages. That's over a, more than a quarter of all the languages that are spoken on our planet. And it's a, pla it's a place which is so diverse that two Africans could be more genetically unalike than a native Chinese and a European. It's a continent with, as you know, a longer historical trajectory than any other. Yet this font of culture, this crucible of humankind, it sits on the very periphery of societal general knowledge barely reflected on in most national curricula. Indeed, we generally know less about Africa and about its cultures and about its economies than anywhere else on Earth. And we've got to put that right. In part, because we owe it to our children, to Africa, and because there are many things that suggest that Africa's future will be as remarkable as its past. That there might actually be a moment in the medium term when serious engagement with this, one of the fastest growing regions of the world, will become an economic necessity. The continent's population will more than double to 2.3 billion people by the end of 2050. It possesses approximately 30% of the Earth's remaining re mineral resource. The largest preserves of precious metals, with over 40% of the globe's gold reserves, and over 60% of its cobalt, 90% of its platinum. It produces 8, billion gal uh, sorry, 8 million barrels of oil every day. A continent of more than 400 companies with revenues of over a billion dollars a year and 1.4 trillion dollars of consumer spending. That's more than India. Africa has quietly become a kind of global I and mean, a very stable powerhouse. And I was really lucky of re to recently attend a, a TED Global Conference at which experts from a whole variety of critical disciplines, from genetics to engineering, they all gathered together. These are people who are pushing human understanding in a variety of different disciplines. And they were invited together to just postulate on the future of humankind. And the only thing that all of the speakers shared, beyond their energy and their optimism, was that they were African, and that they worked in Africa, and that they were absolutely leaders, pioneering in their fields. And I came away deeply, deeply inspired, but also more than a little concerned. The African continent will be increasingly part of our thinking, and yet we teach our children so little about it. And perhaps more tragically, 
we seem to care so little. And it might be that the future of global economics will force us to care more. But I'd argue we should simply do so because it's the right thing to do. We owe it as much to ourselves and to the continent to learn more, to listen more, to try to understand more. I don't think it would require a great imaginative leap to envisage a time when Africa might be a truly global intellectual hub, driving economies of its allies and neighbours, catalyzing the cultures and the intellectual development of many more. Its intellectuals accepted as true global thought leaders, its business community drivers of the world economy. And this, if you think about it, is actually far from being a dream. After all, that description of a possible African future is also a perfect description of a corroborable African past, of a time before colonialism, when African cultures drove intellectual innovation and wealth generation of a significant proportion of the globe. I'm describing a time when Great Zimbabwe dominated the great gold trade routes that fueled the opulent Swahili sultanates and through them the cultures of the Indian Ocean. It was a time when the emperors of Ethiopia presided over the vast kingdom that boasted the longest continuous tradition of Christianity with a formidable transcontinental ecumenical in influence. But even in that glorious company, it was the kingdoms of the Sahara that might be considered the continental jewel in the medieval crown. It's a story that begins long before the medieval period. This is Meroe in Sudan. It's right on the edge of the Eastern Sahara. The, you can see that these are ancient Nubian pyramids and they sit beached on the desert sand. And I, I visited there and we flew from Khartoum out into the desert, hours, hours out into the desert. And we landed in a site that was more remote than anywhere I've ever been before. I can remember stepping out of the helicopter and the helicopter disappearing off into the distance and then just looking in every direction, nothing, nothing to be seen but sand. But we were also adjacent to one of the world's great archaeological sites, one of the most rarely visited. This amazing site at Meroe, sitting on the desert sand, utterly isolated, but carved into the surface of these amazing pyramids are images that give a clue to what this region once looked like. Healthy, yoked oxen once ploughed green fields here. About 4,000 years ago, within the span of oral history, the Sahara was lush and it was green. And it supported a complex ecology, a variety of nomadic people that they worked this land. And with climate change came new ways of life. And it's no coincidence that in this region that a disproportionate number of the greatest empires the world has ever known were formed by this very hostile environment. I mean, we know. We know about Nubia. We know about Egypt. We know about Carthage in the classical era. But the Berber, the Almohads, the Almoravids, and the kingdoms of Ghana and Songhai, and a great many other cultures that rose up and thrived on the western edges of the Sahara in the period of the medieval. They are much less well known. 
And they formed a wonderful nexus of cultures that have left us some of the most astounding cultural artifacts that the world has ever seen. And this is the story that this exhibition tells. As the desert grew, those nomadic communities, they found their traditional ways of life tested and dazzling new cultures began to evolve. And it was these amazingly testing um, uh, conditions that concentrated hard-won skills and new knowledge together for the very first time. And it resulted in an aggressive period of progress. And from these disparate communities of hunter-gatherers grew sophisticated economies not unlike our own today. And these were cultures that had learned to collaborate with the changing environment, working with the benefits of the desert, each culture in turn, working to overturn the one that went before, toppling their rivals, but also overcoming the inexorable onslaught of the desert. And one of the very greatest emerged in the Western Sahara of what is today Mali. And it has left us a stunning, 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 but also equally fragile legacy. And even if we don't know this chapter of history, this is a, a culture that we probably do know something of. After all, this is probably one of the most famous images of a medieval personality. And it's a story that is as fascinating as it is important. And the legacies of what this represents continue to reverberate across Africa today. At the beginning of 2013, many of us watched in utter horror as dozens of Mali's most important ancient monuments were deliberately damaged or destroyed. And it was an example of how these histories, that they're not lost, they're not dormant, they continue to crackle with a kind of contemporary relevance. And in a campaign of systematic vandalism, Ansardin and Al-Qaeda-affiliated militia, they pushed further and further south from their desert strongholds into regions of increasing historical importance, destroying tombs, burning, burning manuscripts, and damaging buildings. And eventually, they converged on the city of Timbuktu. The fighting was brief but devastating, destroying parts of the city's world-famous mosque, one of the ancient madrasas that make up the very center of the city. They were attempting to destroy Timbuktu. And we all know the name Timbuktu. It's a place that he's known, at least colloquially, in the West, as a place that is unknowable. It's synonymous with the idea of the exotic, of the far away. And for centuries, it existed as an interminable frustration, a duel that lay defiantly beyond Europe's grasp. Unlike Shangri-La, scholars knew that Timbuktu could be reached. Unlike El Dorado, merchants were confident that this, con this conduit to the vast gold, res gold reserves of the Mali Empire existed. And unlike Xanadu, the writings of Berber travelers like, like Leo Africanus had shown that this impossible story was based on truly compelling evidence. Timbuktu was a prize that Europe coveted. In 1618, a pioneering company was formed in London with a single objective, building a trading relationship with Timbuktu. But generation after generation of Europeans were thwarted as expeditions ended in murder, in bungling and confusion. Some simply disappeared without trace. 
The catalogue of calamity was long and it was tragic. In 1620, an Englishman, Richard Jobson, mistook the Gambia River for the Niger. In 1670, Paul Imbert, a French sailor, was kidnapped and murdered en route. John Ledyard, an American, died in Cairo in, in, in 1789, before his expedition had even really begun. Daniel Houghton, an Irishman, simply vanished without trace before leaving G Gambia. Frederick Horneman, a German academic, perished on the banks of the Niger. And even Mungo Park, one of the most celebrated explorers of any age, was to drown in the Niger under a hail of spears in 1806. This was a city that held its secrets dearly. The first Westerner to return, having, having claimed to have seen Timbuktu, was a shipwrecked African named Benjamin Rose, who was alleged to have been kidnapped and taken under duress to the city in 1812. Rose was followed by Major Gordon Lang, who traversed the Sahara, reaching the, set, the city in 1826, only to be killed before he could return home. But Lang was, was followed by Re René Kelly, the first European to return home alive, and finally opening up the West to the city on the edge of the Sahara. And the city, I'm sure some of you have, have, have been, it is... Uh, astounding, as, as astounding to visit today as its history. It sits on the River Niger, and the River Niger is a remarkable piece of geography in its own right. It's really very strange, almost kind of um, counterintuitively, that it flows away from the sea. And it draws its strength on the Guinea highlands of West Africa and it pulls huge clusters of streams into a single unanswerable body of water. And then it descends from a lush plateau, slowing as it winds northwards through forested regions across plains, almost in defiance of the formidable heat and topography. And then it slows and languorously, belligerently, it then pushes on toward the Sahara. And almost at its most northerly point, it then bursts into flower, disgorging vast amounts of water and silt across what otherwise would have been arid plains to give life, to form a life-giving delta in one of the most unforgiving landscapes, landscapes on Earth, the Middle Niger. It's a kind of green oasis, a green corridor of fertile land, the perfect place within which an empire could grow and thrive. And sitting, if you imagine it reaching out from the Guinea highlands, sitting on the ring finger of the Niger's outstretched hand was the jewel of the medieval world, Timbuktu perfectly placed on the desert frontier of Mali, one of the greatest cities in one of the greatest empires that Africa would ever produce. And Timbuktu was a desert port for traders from across the Sahara and a gateway for West African goods that sought markets across North Africa and beyond. It was the conduit between cultures that were traditionally opposed, uniting the Sudanic and the Sahelo peoples, the desert and the tropical. It sat on the edge of an, what would have seemed, and continually, even today, if you know this region, it feels an impenetrable body of sand. This is a desert the size of the U.S., a desert that divided some of the most economically aggressive states of the medieval age. This was also a region that controlled gold, copper, salt. So this geography was so important. But simultaneously, whilst the geography was important, it posed the single biggest challenge to life. But it was also 
critical to forming the culture. And perhaps in spite or perhaps because of that history, the geography of this city grew into something which was utterly exceptional. I mean, if you visited today, you would know why this became a World Heritage Site. Known as the city of 333 saints, it's the home of 16 shrines to Islamic Sufis. And it's a collection of buildings that were believed to have been built around 1327. Some, if you go, you'll see most of them are adobe, built from wood, earth, and straw, but completely unique. And this was an empire that comes into being in a meaningful way in the first half of the 13th century. And it's wrestled from the shifting trade routes and societal chaos that were the fading empires of another great empire, the Ghana Empire. For almost a thousand years, the Ghana Empire had ruled a vast region of what is today southeast Mauritania and western Mali. Eventually, the routing of Ghana by the Ber their Berber neighbours presented an opportunity to build a new kind of state. Its founder, Sunjata Keita, was a formidable military strategist, a visionary who, like so many African leaders, understood the importance of securing his own story. He wanted to be remembered as the man who consolidated this period and this piece of geography. He wanted to create a state that was as coherent as Ghana had been as ambitious as Ghana had been. But we actually know little about him, little about his early life. He was born about 1235, and so he grew up in a period of profound flux. That's something we do know. He would have grown up, if you remember from what I was saying earlier, in this period of Ghana's demise, of the chaos that surrounded it. He would have learned something of the cultures, of the earlier ancient cultures, who had left their mark on this landscape. Perhaps some of the, the ancient prehistory of the area of the, of, of the Sahara. He would have known that this was a region that once upon a time was fertile, that thrived on an agrarian, on an agrarian, agrarian system. He would have seen the transition between the Berber dynasties in the north, and he may have heard about the rise of the Ife to the south and perhaps the, dom the dominance of the Solomonic dynasty in Ethiopia to the east. He would have known that this was a moment of African renaissance, a moment of burgeoning and quickening change, of growing confidence across the continent as new outwardly focused regimes began to build ambitious states. He may have even heard of some of those states that were really beginning to change and to quicken the pace of, of innovation. States like Great Zimbabwe or the Swahili Sultanates, each of them engaged directly or indirectly in forging new relationships beyond the continent, each driven in their own ways to invest in securing their intellectual and cultural legacy through stories. But he was ambitious too, ambitious in his, his own way. He wanted to build a modern state that would last. And at its very heart would be Islam. Within the lifetime of Muhammad, Islam had reached Africa. The great cosmopolitan and intellectually tolerant cities of, the, of seventh century Africa were seen as places of sanctuary for the prophet's often persecuted followers. Religious scholars and their ideas traveled along the inter intercontinental trade routes, working their way across what is today Egypt and Sudan and Ethiopia, simultaneously traversing the Sahara into West Africa. For many, Islam found a distinct identity in Africa, 
and many regard Islam as an African religion. In West Africa, early Islam was one set of philosophical and cultural visions that fitted into a wider regional context of many belief systems. Many would have seen themselves as Muslim, but they would still have engaged in some traditional religious practices. It encouraged the, wild, the wide acceptance of a very liberal form of Malachite Sunnism. Women didn't generally wear veils. They participated in, lib, in the liberal canonization of local figures who were known as Sufis. Even today, some dedicated Muslims in this region continue to wear charms and symbols of traditional African religions. Some will turn to indigenous practice, practices when unwell. And even build, builders who construct and repair mosques might utilize pre-Islamic blessings to bring good luck to their congregations. These are things that were and continue to be accepted. According to Al Bakri, the Cordoban writer, many Malians converted to Islam before the 10th century, but they remained tolerant to traditional religions. When in the 14th century, Ibn Battuta, the Bourbon scholar, visited the Mali Empire, he watched a traditional masquerade with a barely disguised disgust, unable to understand why an ostensibly Islamic culture wouldn't just tolerate su such practices, but would celebrate them at court. This was a culture, this was a form of Islam that thrived on beautiful ideas and was not prepared to relinquish them, relinquish practices that simply worked. And like their Berber contemporaries, the founders of the Mali Empire developed an epic saga of, of origin to impregnably bind their people to this new empire. They crafted a story of the foundation of their state that was as beautiful as the cave paintings of their antecedents. But they learned from Muslim scholars who had visited the courts of Ghana. And they utilized the griots, or the skilled orators and musicians and poets, to, institu to institutionalize and to spread those stories. And at the heart of those stories was the king, was the emperor, Sunjata. He wanted to unite his new kingdom around a sense of state, but with him at the very center. And he forged an epic, the epic of Sunjata, which is still sung and told today. As a measure of his success, you can still visit Mali and hear griots singing, reciting, that same medieval story. And it was part of a fascinating moment that reached beyond Africa. As around the globe, crusade, the crusading Pope Innocent III and the ruthless Genghis Khan, they were simultaneously trying to make their mark on, on newly forming societies, but doing it by telling and retelling their stories. Sujata, he understood that. He didn't just work in isolation. He knew it was a moment in which new cultures would be formed around narrative. But alongside that narrative, critical to the success of his society, he knew it had to be driven by trade. And there are four main routes across the Sahara through which you could carry goods like salt southward and then return with gold. The most important went around the edge, the northern edge of the desert. And you could carry goods like salt on a two-month camel journey through Sijomasa and then eastward toward, um, uh, to, toward Egypt and then out into uh, the Middle East. And it was towns like Timbuktu on or just beyond, be, beyond the fringes of the empire that became vital ports for salt-laden caravans traveling southward and returning with gold 
that they supplied and became critical to the economies of the whole of North Africa and Europe and the Levant. These increasingly important trading ports grew in importance and wealth. And salt, as you can see it here, but it would actually travel, as it still does today, in huge slabs that were car carried on caravans of camels on their backs. In 1352, Ibn Battuta described how trans-Saharan traders would use salt as a medium of exchange, just as he might use gold or silver, that they cut it up into pieces and buy and sell it. But as Mali grew, so the goods that were exchanged across the desert began to diversify. Copper extracted from the Mali Empire's mines might be traded with merchants from the south who supplied them with gold. And that would then be, that would then be um, traded for slaves, for grain, for kola nuts. And like the Ghana kings before them, the Mali um, emperors taxed all gold that passed through their empire. The Mali Empire became fantastically rich. And for much of the next century, control of the Mali Empire passed down through direct descendants of Sunjata. And the very last, Abu Bakr, named after the father-in-law of, of Muhammad, ascended the throne at the beginning of the 14th century. And he inherited an empire that was truly vast. But Abu, Abu Bakr Keita, also known as the Voyager King, he was as ambitious as his four, four, forefathers. But his kingdom bounded the Sahara on one side and the Atlantic on the other. And it actually left him with very scant options for expansion. And he looked with envy at his Berber neighbours, aware of how they'd vanquished Ghana to the south and they'd expanded their empire um, into southern Europe. And Mansa Musa, he was a young man in Abu Bakr's court and he was also his heir apparent. And he charts this psychological change of the emperor as it gnaws away at him this idea that he was going to be an emperor who did not expand his kingdom. He becomes obsessed with the idea of taking on the Atlantic. And Mansa Musa watches with concern at the edge of the court as Abu Bakr begins to build, to define his reign around the idea of taking on the Atlantic. So Abu Bakr builds this huge armada, hundreds of ships that are going to take on this huge ocean. And so they set sail. Abu Bakr stands on the shore, watches them disappear over the horizon. And he tells the captain who's in charge of this armada, do not return until you have found out what is on the other side of the Atlantic or when you've run out of food. They then lament years later when only a single vessel returns. But the emperor is utterly underturned, undeterred by this. And he's going to do it again. But this time, he is going to lead the expedition himself. So he leaves Mansa Musa, his trusted lieutenant. And in 1312, he tries himself. This time, personally leading the naval expedition. Traveling with thousands of fully laden ships. And neither the emperor nor a single ship is ever seen again. And later that year, Mansa Musa ascends the throne. And Mansa Musa, he wants to return to the days 
of imperial glory. But unlike Sunjata, he had all the power, all the money, all the territory he could have desired. And he would have to find his own frontiers to traverse, to define a new paradigm upon which to measure success. And early in his reign, he tries to stamp his authority on his empire. And he wants to suggest a kind of tonal shift between his reign and the reigns of his predecessors. And he was, did not want to be seen as a kind of playboy prince, as an emperor who wants to just consolidate the, and strengthen Miley. But he actually falters in his first steps. He tries to outlaw religious practices amongst his gold miners, suggesting that anyone who practiced a religion other than Islam should be outlawed. He wants his miners particularly to accept a more devout way of life. But the miners didn't simply just resist. Output in the mines fell drastically. And this actually hurts the state more than it hurts the miners. Just like the Ghanaian kings before them, gold nuggets from the empire's mines were generally accepted as the natural legal property of the state. Mansa Musa realized he wasn't just losing money, he was losing power. So he capitulates and he allows the miners to continue to practice their own religions. And of course, the gold production returns to its traditional levels. And he learns an important lesson about governance, how even for an emperor, the most powerful man that Mali has ever seen, the richest man probably who's ever lived, he still had to lead with compromise, with humility. And after these early missteps, Mansa Musa works to give his subjects and their trading partners what they actually wanted, security. And he works with one of the great medieval um, generals, a man called Sagamandia. He works with him to secure the trade routes ridding the countryside of bandits and opening up the Mali Empire to an even greater intensity of trans-Saharan trade. Beyond the traditional exchange of salt um, for gold, that he opens up the trade routes for new things like silks from China, spices from India, Persian fabrics, metalwork comes from Europe, and Arabian horses begin to be imported. And they were exchanged for gold and copper. But again, he feels, this isn't enough. To merely be a better empire, that's not going to satisfy Mansa Musa. He doesn't want just wealth and power. He wanted, like the great Berber dynasties, something that he saw as more prestigious. He sought knowledge. And he pursued it with a focus and a dedication of a general waging a military campaign. I'm sure as you know, the five pillars of Islam are set out in a very particular way. And the fifth, that idea to undertake a pilgrimage or hajj is critical, particularly if you have the resources. Muslims are called upon to make the journey to Mecca. And Mansa Musa decides this is something that he wants to do. He certainly has the resources. But the trip from medieval Mali to Mecca was not one that you would undertake lightly. He knew that a number of his preceding emperors, they tried to make the journey. One at least had lost their life whilst doing so. But Mansa Musa, we know that he's an excellent rider. And he has this huge stable of Arabian horses. And whilst his predecessor may have taken on the Atlantic, 2,000 miles across the sea, the journey to Mecca was even tougher, longer, perhaps every bit as challenging. If you think the journey to Mecca it's three times further 
across some of the most unforgiving terrain on earth. In 1324, 12 or so years after becoming emperor, 60,000 people left the Mali Empire with Mansa Musa. Most would walk every hard mile to Mecca. 8,000 were soldiers, 12,000 personal staff, some were members of his court, but most, these are just ordinary citizens. And along with them travel 80 camels bearing 300 pounds of gold each. Every night they would stop, and it was said to be like a whole town decamping in the desert. And they took with them everything they needed, including a mosque, which they construct so that the emperor could pray. The logistical complexity of shepherding so many people across an arid landscape would be every bit as testing as waging a military campaign or navigating a fleet across the Atlantic. No one had ever engaged in the journey to Mecca in such style and such scale. And his arrival in Cairo in July 1324, was greeted with a grand celebration. Al Makrizi, the Egyptian historian, described by Man describes Mansa Musa's arrival. He sees him in the crowd and he writes, he's a young man with a brown skin, a pleasant face and a good figure, and he's instructed in the Malachite law. And he appeared amongst his companions, magnificently dressed and mounted, and surrounded by more than 10,000 of his subjects. And he brought gifts and presents that amazed the eye with their sp splendor and their beauty. And the Mamluk Sultan, the most powerful man in Cairo at the time, perhaps recognizing Mansa Musa as the richest man the world had ever seen, orders the city to give the visiting emperor everything he desires. But even then, Mansa Musa, according to Egyptian et etiquette, was meant to bow to his host, the sultan. But Mansa Musa, he's a shrewd man. And rather than show his subservience to the sultan as, customary, as was customary, rather than doing that, he kisses the ground in praise of Allah. And it means that his host was forced to welcome him to the court as a peer. He's a kind of natural dis diplomat. He knew that he must accept local mores, but he also knew that he wasn't about to bow to anyone. The sultan was also won over, and he invites Mansa Musa and his thousands of followers to shelter in Cairo over the summer, perhaps knowing that the hugely wealthy man might bring benefit to his city's economy and it, with his generosity. And it's often been said, and it's one of the most widely known facts, that this man and his retinue, they give away so much gold that it has repercussions. It collapses the price of gold in that part of Africa for a decade. And when the cooler weather arrives, Mansa Musa and his caravan, they push on to Mecca. And after completing his pilgrimage, he stays to meet some of the great Islamic scholars and imams. And over the period of the Hajj, as you can imagine it, areas of Mecca, they attract some of the finest thinkers of the age to spend time in each other's company and to exchange ideas and gossip. And you could imagine that he may well have met scholars who had traveled from the newly established university in Salamanca or from the ancient Berber centers and intellectual centers of excellence in North Africa. He may have met some of the sorts of traders um, who'd come from Cairo. Some would have doubt it, doubtlessly hailed from the, the courts of Venice, from the madrasas of the burgeoning Ottoman Empire. But we know that Mansa Musa, this man who felt that he could buy and sell anything, but he's utterly entranced 
entranced not by amazing things that he sees, but by the stories he's being told. And as he makes arrangements to return, he decides to invite a number of these intellectuals and a group who claimed actually that they were descendants of the prophet himself to return to Niani, his capital, with him. And amongst them is one of the greatest poets and architects of the age, Abu al-Sahili. This was a man who learned his trade as an architect under the formidable Berber architects of Granada. So as much as being a pilgrimage, it's also a statement to the world about his wealth, about the ambition, about the culture of Mali, of West Africa. And the news of his journey, it does exactly what he hopes. It reverberates across the Middle East and Europe. Fifty years later, Abraham Kreskes, the cartographer, he would immortalise Mansa Musa, holding a gold nugget at the centre of his Catalan Atlas, made for Charles V. It's an image of a particular kind of African wisdom and wealth that will become a point of inspiration for European artists for centuries to come. And when he gets home, he engages his architect, Abu Sahili, to construct one of the most spectacular mosques that West Africa has ever seen for his new Timbuktu. And according to the Berber historian Ibil, Ibn Khaldun, the builder was paid the equivalent of more than $2 million. And the complex of buildings that surround it, they're still used today. And they're built from that same material that I was talking about earlier, wet earth mixed with straw, moulded around a timber structure to create these beautifully well-insulated buildings that are organically shaped strong enough to withstand ferocious winds and occasional rains. And when complete, this mosque comprises of courtyards and prayer spaces big enough for a congregation of 2,000. It was and it remains an architectural masterpiece, one of the most iconic buildings in Africa, and I would say the world. And over the next decade, The great mosque and the buildings around them develop into the most comprehensive and important African archive since the Library of Alexandria. And at its peak, Timbuktu could accommodate 25,000 students and housed at least 400,000, perhaps as many as 800,000 manuscripts. And the city was a match for the most respected universities in Europe. And around these key madrasas grew up an ecology of private libraries, of publishers, of booksellers, who all become hugely wealthy. And in some ways, it's like a uni European university, except it has no central senate. It's made up of independent madrasas and libraries, each led by their own imam or scholar. But in a way, it is like a European university. Students meet in courtyards and rooms and corridors, and they learn formally, particularly subjects like Arabic, like law, like history, astronomy, chemistry, philosophy, medicine, but also practical trades. But at the heart of the curriculum, developed by the most respected intellectual luminaries of the age, were Quranic studies, Quranic and Arabic studies. If one was to transpose Latin for Arabic, substitute the Quran for the Bible, we might well be describing a medieval European university. Like its emperor, the city was driven by the pursuit of innovative and rigorous thinking. Even whilst acknowledging the underpinning place of formal religion, the Mali Empire was a deeply liberal state that accommodated the finest academic ideas and invention from wherever they came. It would be within this city's confines that some of the most radical medieval thinking would happen. 
Invention in areas as varied as mathematics and human rights. Its highest academic de degree would take a decade to complete. It was as prestigious as any other within that period. And as its reputation grew, it drew students and academics from across the West and North Africa, from the great madrasas of, 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 that surround Mecca and North Africa. And whilst it may have been established on Mali's eastern border, looking out across the desert, it quickly became a confident, intellectually distinctive center that had its own gravitational pull. And what I find most thrilling about that image of Mansa Musa sitting at the bottom of the Catalan atlas holding a piece of gold is that it represents a man confident but also driven by ideas that weren't just religious. This was about a moment of freeing people freeing ideas, grasping a moment of a kind of democratization of possibilities. And today, as strident fundamentalist intellectual forces like Ansardine and Boko Haram continue to grow in, population, in popularity in parts of West Africa, it is that liberal spirit of dynamic intellectual defiance that in my mind holds these ancient traditions in good stead. When Mansa Musa made Timbuktu his capital, he looked upon his city as the Medici saw Florence, as a center of an open intellectual entrepreneurial empire that thrived on great ideas wherever they came from. The city, the culture, the very intellectual DNA of this region is so complex, so beautifully diverse, it will always, at least in part, be located in storytelling traditions that are derived from, ind from indigenous pre-Islamic culture. That highly successful form of Islam that develops in this part of Mali becomes popular because it accepted those freedoms. It accepted that inherent cultural diversity and the celebration of that complexity, that love of rigorously contested discourse, that appreciation of narrative, the glorious art of the material culture which it inspired, was and remains, in spite of everything, the very spirit of West Africa. And it's that liberal, wonderful, glorious spirit that linked these great West African cultures. It's a dynamic openness that is the basis of this glorious exhibition. Thank you very much.